to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ i plead with you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. Welcome to our series of lessons on the Church of Christ. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church worldwide. Those members would love for you in your local area to stop by and visit the Church of Christ. Just as well at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love for you to visit our website also, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any lesson, you can go to our website and request that, or you can contact us through the information given at the end of this broadcast. Maybe you've got a Bible question, or maybe you'd like to study God's Word further. Friend, we'd love for you to write to us. Let us know that. We'd love to study God's Word with you in any way that might help someone to come in closer line with the will of Almighty God. Today, we think about our second lesson in the series entitled, The Church of Christ, that the Lord's Church is not a denomination. Now, by denomination, when we look up the definition, Denomination carries a couple of ideas. It carries the idea of to name after another or the idea of dividing. And so when we think about denomination, we're talking about religious groups that carry men's names and religious groups that cause division rather than unity in the body of Christ. Why is it the case that the Lord's church must not be a denomination as we look to Scripture, we find a host of reasons why denominations are not acceptable to Almighty God, and we begin by thinking about this one. Why must the church not be a denomination? First, denomination carries the idea of division. It divides what Jesus died to and what God planned to be united. It's contrary to the purposes of God and Christ. Let me illustrate. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus prayed to the Father, I pray that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. Do you think today that the host of religious groups, the host of denominations that exist today, are really fulfilling Jesus' prayer? Do we look like... Do people, denominations, look united? Do we look like one? Of course not. Denominationalism causes division and is contrary to the will of God and the will of Christ. Think about Ephesians 4 verse 3. The Bible says we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Do we look like? Does denominationalism promote spiritual unity? Not at all. There's division, so much division today. I think of the words of Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What is it God really wants? He wants unity, not division. And at its very core, denominationalism causes division. This is why Paul said, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And listen, that there be no divisions among you. Why else must the Lord's church not be a denomination? Simply because denominations are not authorized in the Bible. Where's the authority? to name the church after somebody else? Where is the authority to divide over a certain creed book, over certain followings of men, over certain... You just don't find that in the Bible. 
Denominationalism is not authorized by God's Word. Now, to understand this, we need to understand the principle of only doing what God tells us to. Let, let me illustrate. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, and he said this, Whatever you do, now Paul, what do you mean by whatever? In word or in deed, do all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. To do something in the name of Jesus, according to Acts 4 verse 7, means to do it by His power or authority. And so we've got to do what we do by the authority, approval of Jesus. Where did Jesus approve denominationalism? You just don't find it. You see, Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The Bible says, Mary speaking to the servants in John chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus is about to perform the miracle at the wedding of Canaan, Cana, and she turns to the servants and says, whatever He says to you, do it. Where does Jesus authorize, command, or teach us to be divided in His name? to be a part of a denomination. You just don't find that. You see, we're only to do what God tells us. The Bible says in Romans 4 verse 3, Paul asked the question, what does the Scripture say? Jeremiah 37 verse 17, that great question is asked by an evil king, is there any word from the Lord? Where's the authority, where's the word from the Lord that promotes denominationalism? We're not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. The Bible says we're not to go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. If I cannot add to or take away from, if I am commanded not to go beyond, then friend, clearly you cannot find modern day denominationalism in the Bible and to have that, you would have to go beyond or add to the Word of God. Why else must the Lord's church not be a denomination? Friend, it's clear we must not be a denomination simply because it is as plainly and explicitly forbidden in the Bible as just about anything you read of. Let me illustrate. Denominationalism is sinfully, explicitly condemned in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to look with me in verses 10 through 13. The Bible says... Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, what we've got to recognize here is this is a perfect parallel to what's going on today. Let me illustrate. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, had you asked some of the Christian Corinthians who were Christians, uh, were they a part of the one church? They would have no doubt said, yes, we're a part of the church Jesus died for, but we're the sect that follows Paul, or we're the sect that follows Cephas, or we're the sect that follows Apollos. And then some are saying we're of Christ. Now, here was the problem. They would say, yes, we're part of the one church, but we follow Paul. We're the group that follows Apollos. We're the group that follows Cephas. What did Paul say about that? Let there be no divisions among you. Now, let's make a parallel to today. If most people were asked, are you a part of the, the universal church, what would they say? Well, yes, we're a part of that. We're just a part that follows John Wesley, Methodist doctrine. We're a part that follows Roman Catholic, Papal doctrine. We're the part that follows John Calvin, Presbyterian, or John Smith, Baptist doctrine. Wait a minute now. If it was wrong to follow men then, what does God say today? Let there be no divisions among you. Friend, it's as plain and as clear as anything in Scripture that denominationalism, 
that division and that naming a group after a man and following him, that's just not authorized in the Bible. The Lord's church must not be a denomination because denominationalism follows the teaching of men, not God. Now you may ask how. Well, friend, we've already noted that following men is not right. And so ultimately in its inception it does. But let me illustrate some other ways. In its teaching many times, in its creed books, in its confessions of faith, in its authority and in its practice, denominationalism often follows men, not God. Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, Jesus sternly rebuked these people for that. Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why, Lord? In vain do they worship me. Listen, teaching is doctrine the commandments of men. Can we put men's ideas, men's opinions, creed books, and those kind of things in and that be okay? It follows denominationalism, follows the teaching of men, not God. Whoever transgresses, the Bible says, and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ, here's how serious it is, does not have God as his Father. 2 John 9, remember, don't add to, don't take away. Revelation 22, 8 and 9. Remember, we're not to go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Where do you find? Let, let me just illustrate. I have heard Billy Graham and Franklin Graham go around the country and proclaim as a way of salvation to say the sinner's prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Savior. I accept you into my heart. Come and save me now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Where do you find that in this book? Here's what's amazing. That's a denominational teaching. You cannot in one place find the sinner's prayer as they have promoted anywhere in this book. You can read it from front to back till your eyes bug out and you'll never find. There's one example, just one, and there are a host that could be looked at. Denominationalism is sinful because it follows the teaching of men, not the teaching of our God. Denominationalism, the church must not be a denomination because denominationalism creates unnecessary confusion and doubt among the world. And friend, that's not, that's not what God's about. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, my Bible says, the Bible says, that God is not the author of confusion. Now you think about this. In just say an average town, if there were 50 denominations all teaching something different, would that help somebody? Would that promote unity? Would that draw people closer to God's truth? Of course not. That creates confusion in mass amounts. And so we must realize denominationalism causes confusion and doubt. Will someone know the truth? But no, they've got to get out their Bible and search and examine and see. Is the, it just doesn't bring unity that God wants and that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, prayed for. You know, when we think about denominationalism, and the problem of it, and why the church is not a denomination, we want to emphasize some specific scriptures that clearly teach denominationalism is wrong. Let me illustrate one. I want you to notice in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4, denominationalism is contrary to the will of God because the Bible says there's only one church. Notice in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, Verse number four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. How, how many gods are there? Well, just one. How many lords? One. How many Holy Spirits? One. These are one in every way. How many bodies are there? There is one body. Now, the next natural question is, what is the body that Paul is speaking about there? 
Well, Paul has already defined that for us in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. Notice here what the Scripture says the body is. The Bible says, And He, God, put all things under His, Jesus' feet, gave Him to be head over all things to the church, notice this, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. And so here's what we learn. There's one body. The church is the body. Therefore, how many churches are there? Friend, listen real carefully. God only ever intended to build one church. Paul said it as emphatically as you could ever imagine in 1 Corinthians 12, 20. There are many members, listen now, yet but one body. What's wrong with denominationalism? What scriptures teach that it's not right with God? The passages that are so plain, like Ephesians 4, 4, like Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, like 1 Corinthians 12, 20, that plainly teach the oneness of the church. That's diametrically opposed to the idea of denominationalism. Now, maybe this is a new idea to you. Maybe you were raised in denominational thinking, or maybe you've always thought that was right. Friend, all we're asking of you is this. Just simply get out your Bible. See if the things we're saying come from the Bible. If they do, make changes, and I will promise you those changes demand that denominationalism is not according to the will of God. When we think about what's wrong with denominationalism, what scriptures teach that it's clearly contrary to the will of God, an understanding about who is the scriptural head of the church helps us with that. I want you to notice Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, one more time. The Bible says, And he put all things under his feet, God put all things under Jesus' feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Question, who does the Bible say there is the head of the church? God put Christ as the head of the church. Now, one might think, well, how is denominationalism opposed to that? Here's how. Most, many at least, modern denominations have a head. Friend, listen carefully. The Lord's church has not been decapitated. Jesus is still the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He is reigning from heaven at the right hand of God, Hebrews 1, verse 4, and God's truth is already settled. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And so when we think about the, the head of the church, is the Pope the head of the church today? Friend, it can't be. Jesus hadn't been decapitated. The head's not been decapitated. Jesus is still the head of the church. And if you study most denominations, many at least, will have a head over that religious group. Friend, that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus is still the head of the church. We don't need an infallible, sinful man ruling over the Lord's church. We've got the sinless, Hebrews 4 verse 15, the perfect, 1 Peter 1 22, Son of God who, is, who has our best interest in heart in every way still ruling over the Lord's church. We then mention another set of scriptures which clearly teach that the church cannot be a denomination, that it is contrary, denominationalism is contrary to the will of God. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Paul is speaking to the elders in the church of Ephesus. And he says to them, Take heed to yourself and to the church of God, to the flock, church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. When you think about the church, who is the scriptural founder of that church? Well, many times, if you'll just simply get out a religious history book, uh, you can see that the founder of this church was some man, maybe 1,500, maybe 1,000 years ago. And each one of them will list that. Who's the founder of the Lord's church? Jesus said, I purchased it with my own blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11, No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Who's the founder? Who's the foundation of it? Christ. If therefore... It has as its head or as its founder some man. Friend, that's contrary 
to the teaching of the New Testament. Here's what's great about the Lord's church. We don't claim any human head today. Jesus is still the head of the church of Christ. He's still the founder of it. He's the owner of it. In our name, in our organization, in our respect for authority, we want to give God and Christ absolute honor in everything that we say and do. Another scripture that clearly teaches denominationalism is contrary to the will of God would simply be the biblical plan of salvation. Acts chapter 18 verse 8 kind of sums it up in a nutshell. Many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. If a group is teaching a plan of salvation that you can't find in the Bible or that is contrary to the plan of salvation you find in the New Testament, friend, that's against what the Scriptures teach. As we've already mentioned, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. You don't find that anywhere in Scripture, and yet a host of denominations have promoted that. Here's what you do find. Men and women are told to hear the Word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We're told to believe in Jesus. There's no doubt you've got to believe. Unless you believe I am He, you'll die in your sins, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse number 24. You've got to repent. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. Jesus clearly taught us to confess His name before men. Romans 10 verse 10, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then, just as plain as those scriptures, the Bible teaches you must be baptized to be saved. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Jesus said, that's Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. On the great day of Pentecost, they were told, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. And Peter said it so plainly, baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter 3, 21. Now, let's bring it full circle to what we're talking about. What makes denominationalism against Scripture Many are teaching things that you don't find in God's plan of salvation or are leaving things out. We'll illustrate it this way. We noted that Jesus said baptism was to be saved. We noticed it was for the forgiveness of sins. We noticed it was something essential to be a part of the kingdom of God. Did you know most modern denominations will tell you, yes, you should be baptized. Yes, that's something good to do. But it's not essential to salvation. Friend, can that be God's church if they're teaching something other than what Christ teaches on the plan of salvation? And so these scriptures clearly illustrate one should not be a part of a denomination and that the Lord's church cannot be denominational in its origin. We then think about why is it the case? Let's say today that you've looked in your Bible, you see some of these things, you want to study them further, and you're saying, you know, why is it the case then that I should leave denominationalism? What would cause me to get out of that? Well, friend, here are some things. Denominationalism is actually the way of error and the way of Satan. The Bible says of those who left the Lord's church and went into error that they left truth, they have gone back into that which is unholy and unclean, they have returned as a sow who after her washing is wallowing in the mud again, or the grotesque image, a dog returning to his own vomit. What do those images portray? You've got to leave denominational error because it is the way of truth and don't ever go back to that. Matthew 17 or Matthew chapter 7 uh, verses 13 and 14 says there are only two paths. There is the broad, wide path which leads to destruction. And then there is the narrow, difficult way which leads to eternal life. Friend, the Lord's church that you find in the Bible is striving to stay on that right path and denominationalism with its teaching that you don't find in the Bible is leading down the path of error to destruction. One must leave denominationalism because the Bible teaches that human-made, man-made religious organizations will be destroyed and will not stand on the last day. Let me illustrate. Matthew chapter 15, 
Verse number 13, Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, I know Jesus wasn't talking about gardening or weeds or really trees or anything like that. For in His very next words, He says, They are blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. What was Jesus talking about? What are these plants? What are these blind leaders of the blind? The people who were teaching things in Jesus' day that were contrary to the will of God, Jesus said they won't stand. Pharisees, Sadducees, the Zealots, that's not God's will. And friend, denominationalism that is started by man that is teaching things contrary to that, it's not God's way. When we think about why one must leave denominationalism, please understand there is a dire need to leave it because you cannot find all spiritual blessings in denominationalism. Where are those blessings? The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 3, every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. If Christ's body is the church, if we're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, Ephesians 1, and 23, then that's where those blessings are. You can't have those outside of the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, friend, we encourage you today. Remember, our aim in studying these lessons is to speak God's truth in love. And friend, we want you to listen real carefully. Maybe some of the things we've said are different. Maybe they're challenging. Maybe they're new to you. We just simply ask this of you. Please, get your Bible. See if the things that we've said today are true to the Word and will of God. If they are, all we ask of you is to obey your Bible and to do what God says. Friend, if that's the case, I can promise you, you will not be denominational in what you do, what you say, and what you're a part of. Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? If not, we encourage you to. Won't you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Acts 2, verse 38. And in so doing, the Bible says, the Lord will add you to His church. What do we know about that church? It is not a denomination. May God bless our study together as we think more about the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Reign on high forever with his bride. This is the gospel we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.